what homeowner can do to help working with insurance companies? Our industry tends to be transient. It does. Do you agree that leads spoil sales? Things? There's really only a, a few Aspens that are of any direct competition. What's the easiest state to start a roofing business? What do salespeople want? When we get a project brought into our office internally, it comes out the other side with a completed project and the homeowner couldn't be happier. All right, guys, today we have very different business to highlight in our channel. Uh, we have a lot of hardworking men, guys who started as installers, build their roofing companies, but we don't have a lot of storm chasers. And I say storm chaser with respect. We're here in Minnesota, Aspen Exteriors, actually right in my backyard, 20 minutes from my house. Joe here have been, you built this company in the last 20 years. I did, yeah. For the last 20 years. Yep. Tell me about your company. <clears throat> Humble beginnings, what's your background and how did Aspen Exteriors came about? Back in 1998, I had a couple of buddies that were putting a company together, it didn't exist um, here in Minneapolis metro area. They knew of this industry going on, the storm damage restoration industry down in Texas and it was working and, and, and profitable and they were gonna try to bring it up here. So I got invited to their first meeting. I think I think it was their first meeting and it was at a Hardee's and there was only four or five of us. And they had talked about what this industry is we didn't even have as much as a flyer. I mean, the business plan basically was hail hits roofs, let's go put a company together and let's go talk them into using us to apply the roof and put the roof on, then we'll charge an insurance company and there's money to be made here. I and mean, that was our big business plan that was already going on down in Texas. So there. you were one of the original storm chasers. Back in 1998, we were one of the first. And when I say we, it, I wasn't part owner of that company. I just got asked to join that company in its origin. From 1998, to 2001, the, we grew to about $12 million. And the reason we were able to do that fairly quickly was because we were new, because this industry didn't really exist up here, there wasn't a lot of competition. We'd go to an area and if we saw a sign of another company or even another company vehicle driving around, there'd be a problem. We'd have a confrontation and say, hey, listen, this is my area. You can go a few blocks over, that can be your area, which for anybody that's been in the industry as long as I have, is absolutely hilarious because can you imagine now going up to somebody and saying, hey, this is my they area. Take in, <laughs> they take in signs yeah, so, from each other. It's It got brutal, but. So that doesn't that doesn't really apply anymore. But no. anyways, my point is, is that we got in on the ground floor um, of, of, of this industry. And even though I wasn't an owner of that company, I was with them from Hardy's on. I, I saw everything being developed um, organically. Um, I was involved with various different uh, decisions that were made and things like that. I felt like I had contributed enough at that point to where I should get a piece of the pie to own some of the company, even if it's a little piece, but that wasn't really in the, the cards for them. And so that what's, is what drove me to leave and start my own company. Now in the process, I do have to say, from 98 to 2000, one, I brought a couple friends over who are my business partners here, Matt and Andy Labine. So there's three owners of Aspen, uh, brought them into that company trained them as sales reps and they we, they did that for a while. So when we left, it was us three that left and started Aspen Exteriors in 2002. And we've been going strong and growing every year. And what are you since. doing now? Just give me like 20 million, is it roughly? Uh, last year we did, I think over COVID by the way, which is sure. something I'm extremely proud of being able to do is, is getting past that hurdle. Uh, 24 million last year. The premise of this video, if you will, and I want to put a little bit different narrative. I see so much hate between you know, hardworking guys like crews who don't understand the business side of things. And I wanna show you other way. There is more business models in the roofing industry, the storm restoration industry. You can be a production guy and you can build your business around production. You can build it around sales. But I tell you this, if you can do $24 million a year, you're a construction company. All right, so welcome to Aspen's office. So the first question is yeah. uh, your name. There's so many Aspens out there. I want to know if you ever have uh, any issues with having so many companies names Aspen. I, I hear that uh, suppliers often misuse accounts and charge wrong accounts. Do you have that problem? Yes. Uh, <laughs> basically, there is. There's really only a, a few Aspens that are of any direct competition. The other ones were not really, don't, don't They're bother. They're far away. Yeah. yeah. One of them is out of Missouri. Now they started years after we did. We started in 2002. I think they started in 2006 or seven. 
But w between us and them, we've had conversations, to put it lightly, over time as to whether there was market confusion. And, I, and what we decided to do ultimately in the end was to coexist because I think both their company and ours decided that, yes, there is a market confusion negative side to it sometimes, but there's also on the flip side, a positive side to it too, where we might get a call. They're also in some restoration. Thinking that they're, we're them or they're us. Uh, we don't love the scenario, but we've been this name since 2002. Uh, it, it is who we are. And uh, I, I don't want to say it hasn't caused any issues uh, with market confusion. It does sometimes, uh, but nothing that really stops us in our tracks. So why Aspen? Why did you uh, come up with Aspen? And did you try to trademark it? We did trademark it. It's you actually did? a registered trademark so why, nationally. Why you couldn't go after other companies? Okay, so uh, number one, I don't love lawsuits. I don't <laughs> like creating and just suing people all over the place willy nilly for no reason unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, and people don't understand this, but it's trademarks. When I when we trademark this registered trademark uh, nationally in the country in this industry, we own the name Aspen. How many locations do you have? Where is, the, where is the business? This, our brick and mortar is one location. So we're in, I, I'm, I'm, I might get this wrong, but 22 to 24 states, somewhere in there. That's where you license? Yep, to do work, yes. Um, but this is our one and only brick and mortar location. All these awards and this board right here are awards uh, uh, clubs that we sent, uh, set up. So if you see down here, you'll see the gold club, then the platinum club, the diamond club, and then the double and triple diamond club. So of course, down here, it started off many years ago when we were small, you, had to, you have to do $500,000 or more in sales to make this club the gold. Platinum is 750, diamond is a million, uh, double diamond is 2 million. And because we have some, some, or I should say A, you can see they're a big player around here. Uh, we had to create a triple diamond club for somebody that sold over $3 million. So he sold 3 million in 2017. 2017. Here is our $2 million if you sell $2 million so that, or more. That, that's what they get. We call it our Grammys. Grammys. So, yeah. So we give out these awards. This is Vicki Toft and this is Sarah Johnson. These Hi, guys are, Vicki is a vice president of oper financial operations and Sarah is the vice president of production operations. So Do accounts receivables. Yep. Supplementing, things Billing. like that. And everything production. Billing, so all the money and all the production. So production like permits, mm -hmm. scheduling crews. Everything. Yep. Contract negotiations, plan negotiations, crews, finding crews, suppliers. How do you find crews? Just internet? <laughs> oh, if, um, if you got that figured out, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if we had the answer, we wouldn't say it on this. <laughs> We're a company that builds our system both externally and internally to, we, I always say this, and these guys will vouch for, they probably get sick of me hearing me say this. I want to build a perfect roof system. And by perfect roof system, what I mean is, when we get a project brought into our office internally and we take it and let's say we put it through our assembly line, it comes out the other side with a completed project and the homeowner couldn't be happier. And they're telling everybody at the grocery store and their neighbors and everybody at church and everybody else to use us. And there's no issues ever, the perfect <laughs> roof system. And if there ever is any issue at all, at all, we're like flies on shit. Can I swear on this? Like flies on shit, uh, where we're all like, how could that have happened? inside of our perfect roof system, that's impossible. So that's either a person problem that has to be addressed, or it's a system and process problem that we need to tweak. But I say, we need to get to a point where we have a perfect roof system. Now, all of us know there is no such thing as a perfect system. And, and, and we're not in a, in a vacuum here, that's, time is moving. <laughs> and there's insurance companies, Morgan and so on. So we have to change on the fly too. But to get it as close to that as possible is our goal. And that's where the frustration comes in because it's our objective to provide the absolute best service and product to our customers and experience. And it makes it difficult when outside sources, outside places like say supply companies, uh, throw a little wrench in that system. So we try to explain it to our customers what's going on. But of course, as you may know, owning your own company, they don't, they've never met the supply company. They've men, never met the dump company or this. So you're the one they're holding accountable. So even if times get extended, like because of COVID, we just have to try to monitor that. And we have to, the biggest thing I would say, the advice I would give anyone, including ourselves, <laughs> is to really live by the adage of 
under promising and over delivering. I have a question for you. What homeowner can do to help working with insurance companies if they're hard to deal with or there's delays, anything they can do? What advice would you give to the homeowner? Well, I, and I do do this. Um, usually just to educate the homeowner on the estimate and provide them knowledge. You know, the more knowledge a homeowner has, the more they'll understand what's going on. They don't usually deal with roofing. So they get estimates and they have our estimate and they're like, well, what's the, well, why are what they gives? different? And what's, you know, just educating them. Is... Do you see that homeowners tend to trust what adjusters are telling them? Yes. Over you? They do to start. To start? Yeah. How do you overcome that? How do you just, win the trust of the homeowner? Just providing them the documentation, providing them eagle views, providing them material receipts. Yeah. I argue with people all the mm -hmm. time, doing less is doing more. Do you agree? Yeah. What I wanted to do was create a foundation of roofs only and then build a skyscraper on that. It's my goal to build the perfect roof system and also to become not only large, but also the best roofing uh, contractor in the whole country. Storm damage roofing contractor in the whole United States, not just Minnesota. And in order to do that, we had to focus on roofing. I can't be pulled in a million different directions. By the way, trying to create a system with a billion different, I mean, just forget about it, okay? You're never gonna get to the perfect system like that. It's just, as far as I'm concerned, damn near impossible, if not impossible. So we wanted to become a master of one, and that's roofing. So this area right here is basically kind of like a utility area that we can use as an overflow for people. Behind you is a lot of the paperwork and contracts and things of that nature that we use, such as if you look in uh, here like this. Is it possible to be a paperless company in this business? So we actually are a paperless company internally, <clears throat> but not externally. Okay, so externally, we still have paper contracts and things of that nature, but when it gets turned in, it gets turned in digitally. No actual physical documentation gets turned in, so we are paperless inside of this office. I see Missouri, Pennsylvania, Kansas, Idaho, Texas, Colorado, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa. What's the easiest state to start a roofing business? Well, the first answer to the question is, where's the most profitable place? Because in my opinion, that would be the best place to start a business. You dig in, you do the hard work, you build a company that can compete and you're in the most profitable market, which would be probably the Midwest or the East Coast, in my opinion. Then there's the answer to the question, maybe go the path of least resistance, right? Where it's, you're not getting, you're not throwing yourself to the wolves and you're starting a company in a place that's uh, semi-profitable. Uh, but it's a lot easier path of resistance. But I will say that, that the places where there's less path of resistance is getting thinner and thinner because of the uh, competitiveness of our industry. However, the really profitable markets is, it's a whole different beast than other places. What's the least profitable states have you seen? I don't know the answer to that, but I do believe they're, they're always south. Can you explain Xactimate to homeowner who have no idea what Xactimate is? This comes down to a topic that has to do with retail versus storm claims. So retail is if you just need a new roof and you go get estimates and then you pick your company and you pay them and they do your roof. Storm damage restoration is a whole, whole different thing. It's a whole different beast. If we were a retail company, to be quite honest with you, um, which we're not, uh, my, our prices would be a lot higher than we charge because insurance companies are only willing to pay a certain amount of money. So basically what happens in a nutshell, and I'll try to summarize this is, and here's how Xactimate came about, which was the question, uh, is contractors wanna get paid as much as possible. Clearly, they wanna get paid the, to the moon. And then insurance companies wanna do what? They wanna get pay, pay out as least as possible. Well, here's what gave. A third-party software called Xactimate came about, and there's other third-party softwares too that some insurance companies use predominantly Xactimate. And they said, listen guys, everybody needs to get along here. What we're gonna do is quarterly, all across the country and all the different regions, we're gonna evaluate what's the cost of materials, what's the cost of labor, what's the cost of permitting, all this kind of stuff. And we're gonna determine what we feel is a fair and reasonable price for the costs. I know you're taking your sales guys on to Mexico every year. Yeah, and we decided at one point, how do we, how should we recognize and reward our top producing sales reps and managers, sales managers. And we came to the determination, we were gonna take them on vacation. So all of our top sales reps, anyone that sells over $500,000 a year qualifies for the trip. 
and all expense paid uh, trip. And we, we usually go to like an all-inclusive in Mexico. So we've been to Cabo, we've been to Puerto Vallarta, we've been to Cancun, all, all kinds of different places. It's one of the things I look forward to the most because it's fun, obviously, but it allow, it's, it's, a, it's a point in time that allows me to build a closer friendship and relationship with some of these guys because they're traveling around the country and I'm busy too. So we don't have a lot of time to talk or hang out other than business. So it's a really good time to become friends with everybody and build that relationship. What he's taking a picture of. Check this out. Let me see. 2018 subcontractors, 2017 subcontractors, 2016 subcontractors. Two How many people plus. doing supplements? Two. Two. Which is this person, and whose name is Crystal, and Vicky. So Vicky and Sarah both still jump in, especially, you know how it's a bell curve? Mm -hmm. So our business comes in in the winter, it gets slow and it's kind of a bell curve or up and then that back down. Yep. So instead of hiring a bunch of employees that we don't really have a need for throughout the season, Vicky and Sarah will jump into during our busy part of the season and they will also be doing production or in Vicky's case, supplements. Sure. What do you guys do? I'm Ben Lanigan. I'm the manager of marketing here at Aspen. So all of our marketing functions. So you're Aspen. responsible for zero leads this year? Exactly. <laughs> How hard it is to advertise storm uh, restoration business? I would say that it's just like anything that you can throw money anywhere, but it's a matter of being efficient with ad spend and having areas that it's a mix between, you know, what kind of damage is in areas what is our pricing in that area and then also um you know what are the codes there you know there's some markets that there's ice and water and it makes sense to have a little bit higher ad spend because we're gonna you know profit a little bit more per claim in those areas and we're gonna send a lot more reps and uh it's just finding that balance and then also there's some reps that we have at aspen we're really they're fine on their own and leads are bonus to them and they're gonna sell over a million dollars without me or not. And those are my favorite reps. Do you agree that leads spoil sales guys? I think in my opinion, leads should be reserved. If as a company, I'm gonna pay for leads. They should be reserved for your proven sales reps that can proven to close deals. They've earned those leads. And I think that companies will find, and we found that when you do provide leads to people like that, sometimes they'll go, I've got enough, I don't need them. Or you'll provide a couple leads and that will keep them going for weeks because they work the referrals. They know how to do it, right? Sure. When you start giving leads to lazy people, to people that aren't willing to put in their dues, to go out there and get knocked down and get back up and learn how to sell and learn this industry uh, and go knock doors and create their own business and their own leads and their own referrals, all you're basically doing is creating a lead baby where they're sitting at their house with their feet kicked up and waiting for you to give them another lead. I'm a firm believer that yes, we do have marketing and yes, we do invest and yes, we do have leads, but only the closers and proven people are gonna get those leads. Now, if you're fairly new and starting out here at our company, we have an excellent training program. And so we'll try out a couple of leads on you. But if you're not closing these, it's time to go boots to the ground and get your customers and get your referrals and prove yourself and then ask us again for a couple more leads. Nathan, what do you do? <laughs> like, what's your hottest market this summer, this year? Williston. Yeah, Williston, North Dakota. How many jobs are you gonna get from there? Like, what's your split of the, like 10%, 20% of your revenue this year? 15 to 20? So pretty big storm there? Yeah. The most important man in the house. <laughs> I've seen uh, your picture over there with you in eighth grade. Yeah, that was just a couple years ago. <laughs> so what do you do? I am the sales director here. Naturally. As a sales director, I have a question for you. What do salespeople want? I think salespeople want to experience success, um, whether that's their own growth, you know, learning to be better at sales. Um, many of our salespeople, I believe, just really kind of want to help people, um, take pride in what they do. How many people do you have uh, in sales right now? So we have 46 full-time people in the field, and I think we have 16 part-time guys in the field. How do you manage them remotely? A lot of phone calls, conference calls? So we've uh, got a number of uh, programs that we created in-house that kind of track numbers and all the things that they've got going out in the field. And then we have uh, nine sales teams. So we have nine remote sales managers that are in the field with their teams 
doing daily meetings, uh, helping with objections, um, training pretty much daily. I believe that to make an effective salesperson, one without a lot of experience takes about a year of development. What's the most important thing in sales? We, we take an approach here and we train our sales reps what we consider a sale by education. Being able to communicate well and teach the information that you know to your potential customers is probably the most important thing. There's only one thing in my mind beyond all else. And I believe that that's relationships. So I heard a quote out of a book one time, the sooner you realize there's no such thing as sales is the sooner you're going to be able to succeed at sales. Now what that means is when you go in as our company or any company on planet earth and you start throwing facts and figures their way, we're at A plus with this and we've been around this many years and we got that badge and this blah, blah, and that blah, blah, blah. These are all good supporting information to provide a customer. However, there's a whole lot of other companies that can say they got some pretty cool stuff too. They got the A plus with the BBB. So does that company, so does that company. It's very easy to do that. So you gotta distinguish yourself somehow from the pack, from the other good companies or great companies. And how you do that is through building a relationship. The sale is just the default of the relationship you created. And until people understand that, they won't be able to sell a thing. This is a wrap. Uh, fun fact is they don't have a warehouse. I love warehouses, but this is more sales organization than production organization, which is, I say it in a very respectful way. I mean, you can see how much work they produce and they know what they're doing. Ethan, you want to add as a advice or tip to our audience at the end? Well, speaking of, I'm going to give a shout out to somebody if you don't mind. Sure. Speaking of warehouses, I'm going to give Dustin a call over at Apple and I'm going <laughs> to... Dustin, if you're watching this, I'm going to call you soon. I'm going to come visit because uh, I'm curious to see your facility. The best advice I can give customers are our industry tends to be transient. It does. Mm -hmm. It just is what it is. You can't have 50 roofers in a small little town that gets hit with hail. It can't sustain that. But it does need the 50 roofers to fix all the roofs in a hard hit town. Along with a transient type of business and industry, of course comes along some sneaky type of people that try to take advantage, okay? So my best advice I can give customers that have had hail damage and need to get it fixed and need to pick a contractor is do your research. Make sure they've been in business for a long time. In this industry right now, there's no reason not to go with a company that hasn't been in business for 10, 12, 15 plus years. Absolutely no reason. So they should have an A plus with the BBB. They should have the same types of scores with Angie's List absolutely do your research and make sure that the company that you're choosing is a trustworthy, fair, and reputable contractor.